All right, welcome everyone to this month's Data Science on AWS Meetup. We do have a, a really great and packed agenda for today, so it's going to be really exciting. Um, just a few words, introduction. My name is Antje Bart. Um, I work as a developer advocate at AWS, and with me also is Chris Frankly, co-host of the Meetup and co-author of our book. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, good to see you again. We have great speakers today. Uh, pretty exciting technologies, open source technologies, and we'll be showing how to use them on AWS and beyond. And before we start, I just want to give a quick update in case um, you already know our book, hopefully, Data Science on AWS. Right after last month's meetup in March, we actually released the German translation. So if you happen to be a German speaker, let me put this here in the chat. We do have a German edition now of the book too. So you can go ahead and check that out if you want. Um, super exciting. So we love seeing the book being translated and being made accessible um, for more languages. So yeah, this just came out end of March, all in German data science mit AWS. <laughs> okay. to Marcus who yeah. Helped, uh, translate that and, and even found a couple typos and things as well. So yeah, we appreciate it, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Good job there. All right, let's switch to today's meetup. Um, as Chris said, we have um, some great open source topics today. Um, the first one will be presented by Paul Hargis. I'm going to hand over here in just a little bit. Um, senior solution architect also um, for AI and ML at AWS. He will talk about how to use open source um, Delta Lake with um, Amazon SageMaker. And then the second talk for today, I'm also excited to welcome Matt from DBT Labs. And Matt will help us to understand a little bit better what is DBT, the data build tool. Um, it's an open source framework, but he will show us how we can use DBT in ML and data pipelines. So also gonna be a super exciting talk here right after Paul. All right, and with that, let me stop my screen share and hand it over to Paul. <clears throat> hey, uh, welcome everyone. This is Paul Hargis. Um, Auntie, can you still hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> okay, great. Nice to meet everyone. I'm a. Um, my name is Paul Hargis. I'm an AI ML specialist, uh, same as uh, Chris. So Chris has joined the same team now, finally, as as I am at, at Amazon. And it turns out that Chris and I have known each other for something like eight years. Um, so we go back a while. Um, thanks for inviting me today. <clears throat> I'm going to start presenting. Um, I've got a demo to walk through, but before we get to the demo, uh, I want to outline uh, the solution that we're going to walk through today. So I'm going to stop my video and start sharing. <clears throat> and then uh, please let me know when you can see it. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, so today's talk <clears throat> is going to summarize the work that um, myself and a few others, including Vedant Jane, have done here at AWS within the last couple of months. Um, so, and <clears throat> as you may have heard about um, the people over at, at the creators of Spark at Databricks have created this uh, Delta Lake um, in, uh, IO tool uh, library, I guess. So let's talk about what is Delta Lake and how you can access it um, from SageMaker. So for those that don't know, SageMaker is the end-to-end -end platform <clears throat> that we built here at AWS to do to enable machine learning, uh, building building machine learning use cases, uh, including you know training uh, training your model, deploying it, hosting it, etc. So <clears throat> we're gonna here's the agenda that I'll go through in the next sort of 25 minutes or so. We'll talk about the benefits of integrating SageMaker with Delta Lake, which, and Delta Lake is uh, released as open source. Uh, we'll talk about briefly some use cases, uh, and then I'll show you the recommended methods from accessing this. And then uh, we'll walk through the prerequisites for running in a studio environment, and, uh, and then I'll go on to the demo. 
<clears throat> so a lot of you have probably heard of Delta Lake. It's been in the open source community for, for quite a while now. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, Databricks created the, the Delta Lake uh, library. And so Delta Lake uh, is a way, so you've probably heard more commonly data lakes. So data lakes is sort of the generic uh, tool or generic term for uh, storing disparate data types uh, within the same storage. Um, and so Delta Lake operates on top of what we call object layer storage. And these are things like Amazon S3 or Azure Data Lake Storage. Uh, so S3 is Amazon's uh, object layer storage. Um, different than a file system, so it's object layer. Delta Lake um, then provides uh, functionality on top of that. It's, so it's called a storage layer protocol, and it brings additional functionality. And these things include some of the more popular features include uh, versioning of data, time travel, schema enforcement, et cetera. Um, so as I mentioned, Delta Lake, although created initially by Databricks, is an open source project and can have many, many different contributors at this point. So, uh, so why have we built an integration from AWS SageMaker? So our objectives for doing that is to enable what we call a hybrid machine learning platform so that we, we want to be able to interoperate cleanly with more third-party tools. Um, primarily, those include Databricks, although they do include DataRobot, DataIQ, and, and some other tools as well. Um, we also have solutions that utilize MLflow to deploy directly onto SageMaker. Uh, so we have a broad set of solutions that uh, what we call a hybrid ML platform. So we want to also allow our customers to leverage uh, these same tools. And uh, from AWS point of view, you know, this enables them to on-ramp uh, to SageMaker capabilities and, you know, such as SageMaker hosting, which is used for inference. So the more, you know, and SageMaker hosting is uh, well recognized as the industry standard or the, or the leading leading tool in the industry for doing inference uh, for many reasons. So uh, additionally, we want customers to be able to extract value from their pre-existing investment in their Delta Lake. Um, and we want to be able to have them leverage this in place without having to duplicate the data. So uh, for AWS, we have multiple customers that are using and storing data in Delta Lake. Uh, these include some names you may have seen before, Coursera uses Delta Lake for profiling their courses and generating user recommendations. Uh, FlowServe is running a large uh, POC right now to, to integrate the two tools. Um, Bose and Nike, those are names you probably have heard, um, running Delta Lake across you know, their business units. So, um, so during today's demo, I'm gonna actually use this, this first solution, but there's a couple of different, there's, there's several different methods that you can use to interoperate with the data in a Delta Lake. Let's start at the bottom, since that's uh, sort of the most accessible or easiest approach. The simplest approach is just simply to utilize the objects in S3 um, that are created by a Delta Lake and, and simply uh, point at those underlying Parquet files. So, so Delta Lake utilizes the Parquet format Although you can also specify CSV format, but by default, you get the uh, Parquet format, which Parquet is another open source storage format that has um, you know, various benefits uh, that you, you, you may have heard of Parquet, probably already worked with it. So, uh, so anyway, at the bottom here, we can use, uh, we can directly or natively use PySpark, which is the, the Python interface for Spark. Uh, and we can use the pandas library to load Parquet files directly from their S3 UR, uh, URI location. Uh, an, another alternative is to access Delta Lake tables via SQL. So the SQL uh, language. So in, in AWS, that would be referencing the Glue catalog. So AWS Glue catalog is where 
to restore the schema for the Delta Lake tables. And then we can use query tools like Athena, uh, which is our query engine on top of S3, uh, to, to interact with that data. And finally, the Delta Spark library. So the Delta Spark library also is an open source project and Delta Spark gives you access to the full functionality of Delta Lake, including the topics that we mentioned, the schema enforcement, versioning, et cetera. So that's the demo that we that I run in a minute is going to use Delta Spark. So what I'm going to show you, so SageMaker has multiple um, environments that you can run Jupyter Notebooks in. So primarily they include uh, SageMaker Studio and as well as Classic Notebooks. So I'll define the differences in just a second, but the uh, today we're going to run in our, what we call our IDE, a full featured IDE SageMaker Studio. And in order to install some dependencies, so in order to do this, we're gonna to have to uh, make a few installations uh, in that environment. So we have to install OpenJDK for access to underlying Java, uh, the JVM. We're going to install a particular version of PySpark. And finally, we're gonna install the Delta Spark open source library itself. So, um, so let's go ahead, let me hop out of here. All right, so this is, so let's, this is the AWS console home. This is where you get access to all of the features or the services at AWS. Um, and so we have, you know, various uh, uh, tools, many different tools that are available here. Um, and let, let me just, before I start with SageMaker, let me scroll over here and show you, like, how did I create this initial data that I'm going to load? Uh, so I wanted you to get a, um, have some confidence that we're, we're working with the real Delta format. So what I did was I installed uh, Databricks Enterprise on my AWS account and so this notebook, which is, uh, if you, those of you who have used Databricks will recognize this. This is the standard interface uh, to Databricks uh, notebooks. So, and, and this, this notebook is used actually by Databricks uh, to demonstrate their Delta library. So you'll see that there's a file here. Um, uh, this, this data is loans data taken from, the, it's a Kaggle hosted uh, data set for customer loan data. And so that's the data we're going to look for, look, look to run today. So, so for example, um, you know, this, this notebook is meant to uh, highlight or showcase the capabilities of Delta Lake and, and the simplicity of, of doing so. So just to, you know, show you, I can, uh, you know, th this statement right here is the one that actually uh, creates the uh, you know, uh, so, uh, dot write dot mode. Um, this one actually creates the Delta Lake table that we're going to use today. Okay, so let's go back to SageMaker and AWS. So, um, in order when when you install um, AW when you install Databricks on AWS, you you have to create some S3 buckets and you have to create what are called IAM roles. So IAM roles, if you may know, are uh, the uh, identity and access management. And IAM roles enable something we call role-based access control. Um, you'll see uh, uh, some other people in here, so some guy here named Chris Fregley. Uh, we're all, <laughs> we've been sharing this account. Um, but essentially when you install Databricks, you'll, you'll get this control plane um, role that uh, allocates um, a bunch of different EC2 permissions. Just wanted to mention that that this is part of the installation itself. So you'll see that um, there's a bunch of different permissions that are enabled. Um, so we're operating in a secure environment. Now, let me uh, run over to um, Studio now. Okay, so Studio, as I mentioned, is a full, full featured IDE uh, that runs um, in the SageMaker environment. So um, and so you, some of you will recognize the Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab extensions that are running, running here. 
So let's let's kick off the notebook. I actually already ran this uh, about 30 minutes ago. Uh, so let's walk through this notebook. So uh, basically, we're going to read and write uh, Delta tape Delta table using the Delta Spark library here. Um, we're going to do these three prerequisites that I mentioned. Uh, and then, and so, yeah, so this is the, before we get started on the, the notebook, this is, this is the documentation for Delta Lake. So, um, it's a docs.delta.io, and then the library that we're using is this one here. This is the, you see it's hosted on Delta.io slash Delta. So, this is the open source library that we're using today. And uh, by the way, we'll we'll uh, continue to try to answer questions in the chat as we as we move along. I'm not going to take the time to to read them yet, but Chris is hopefully uh, getting to some of them and on to. Okay, so so what we have here is I've allocated this bucket, um, and this is the area that I've allocated for the Delta demo that I'm doing. So the first thing is we're going to see this that there's a a single CSV file out here. It's 2.6 megabytes. And we're going to go um, uh, load that and then create a, uh, a delta table from it. All right, you see here that uh, first we're going to install these uh, prerequisites that we talked about. So the first cell here is uh, installing the OpenJDK using the conda command. So you'll see that uh, certain uh, dependencies were brought in, including the OpenJDK version 8. You see those downloaded right there. Um, next, we will do uh, a pip install of PySpark. So I'm going to request version 3.2.0, which is a fairly recent, fairly recent uh, version. So you see that that was installed, and then we actually installed the Delta Spark library version 1.1. Uh, we install SageMaker here, and then we're ready to to get going. So uh, we do we do first a few imports. Uh, so we'll import pandas, uh, we'll import PySpark, and so that we can create a Spark context. So the first, the first uh, job to do when you're running Spark uh, anywhere, uh, regard SageMaker or anywhere, is to create a um, what's called the Spark context. So for us to do that, we're um, inside of SageMaker. We have to bring in a few packages, and so what you'll see is I've, I've accumulated these uh, additional packages so that the Spark session can be created. You'll see here the io.delta, so that's the, the Delta core library. And you'll see that we also leverage this Hadoop library, so Hadoop AWS, uh, and the versions are shown here. So uh, these, are these are specified using what are called Maven coordinates. So if you've built tools with Maven, you'll recognize the format here. So, uh, so I include the Maven coordinates of these two libraries that are required in order to instantiate the Spark context. Um, so the next thing is we're we're going to use the builder um, pattern to create this. So um, you'll notice a few other configuration items in addition to the packages. Uh, we have to uh, we have to specify a couple of extra settings to enable the Delta Spark library to operate correctly. So Spark SQL Cloud extensions, we're going to reference the Delta Spark session extension, and then the SQL catalog, Spark catalog, we're going to, these are two prerequisites in order to utilize the Delta Spark library. The last line here of configuration is specific to Studio. Uh, so the way that SageMaker gets its credentials is it has essentially a list of credential providers, which it will walk through sort of in a daisy chain fashion. And the, uh, this one is to specify that the, uh, we need access to the container credentials provider. And that's because Studio runs in a containerized environment. So that's just making sure that we can get access to those IAM roles that we talked about. All right, so we've done that. We've instantiated the Spark context and now we're ready to move forward with Spark. We see we got the Spark version 3.2 is accessible. All right, so now, uh, again, this publicly available data set, uh, it's actually originated from Lending Club and hosted on Kaggle. 
Um, so we will use uh, what's called the default bucket out here. Um, so StageMaker, you can you can just reference a, a default bucket in order to get access uh, to that. Uh, we are going to upload the raw CSV file to uh, S3. So um, I, I stored it here locally just in case. So the first time that I run this, um, then I do an upload. Once I've done that, then it's it's sitting out here and ready to go, and I don't need to do it again. So that's under this raw CSV. Okay, so we've uploaded that. Um, now, next thing is we're going to use Spark uh, to do a read. We're going to read it in, and we know that it's a CSV format. So we provide what's called the S3 URI, which is right here. And then we do a spark.read in order to, to load that. Um, we, can, uh, we can instantly sample the data types that are part of this data frame. So we see that we have uh, almost 50,000 records and they contain the following attributes or, or columns. We can do a quick show to look at the data. This is our loans data, it looks reasonable. Uh, we have interest rate over here. Boy, I hope we don't get back to these levels of interest rates, but that's the direction we're headed, I guess. Um, okay, so, so next thing is we're, we're going to start to interoperate uh, directly with Delta format tables. So again, we have to create this S3 URI. Um, and just one quick note is uh, when, we're in, when we're referencing uh, Hadoop formatted, meaning um, so Delta Lake reference, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, it leverages the Hadoop AWS library. So when we do that, um, in order to get full access to those capabilities provided by those libraries, we change the protocol from S3 to S3A. So just want to mention that um, if you're running this on your own, uh, and by the way, uh, I will give you the link to this repository right after the talk. So you can run it yourself. So we are utilizing the S3A protocol. That's why you see that. Next step is we're going to actually write this out as a Delta form table. So let's go look at that location called Delta, Delta Demo Delta Format. So we run out here. So here we are, Delta Demo Delta Format. And you notice I've written out here a couple times, including earlier today. So nine, I'm in central time, so it's nine like 20 minutes ago is 9.55, April 18th, right here, tax day. All right, so let's keep going. So we were able to write that out successfully with a single, really a single line, single line of code, we were able to create a Delta formatted table. The next thing is let's, uh, let's query that using standard SQL syntax to make sure that the data looks okay. So we put together a, a SQL statement and then we run it using Spark SQL syntax here. So we've done a, run a Spark SQL command and we get uh, similar data to what we saw when we displayed it using uh, above using Spark, you know, looking at the Spark data frame. So we verified that we can access this data in multiple ways, including SQL. All right, so next we're going to uh, use the Delta table functionality. The so Delta table is the primary instance that is utilized to take advantage of um, the Delta table functionality. It has a bunch of static methods. So we're gonna use a few of these. First one is the is Delta table. We run that quickly and we see that it is in fact true. So it is uh, under, so Delta Spark library sees this as a Delta table. So that's confirmation. Next is we're gonna use the four path, uh, for path method here. Um, and then we're going to start to look at the history. And so what we notice is we can scroll through the history and it has, if you remember when I look, when we look at the S3, you see I've, I've stored this data a couple of times and uh, over the last few months. And so Delta is keeping track of these versions. You'll see, you know, version nine, version eight, version seven, et cetera. So we have a scrollable history of you know, the, the changes that have happened to this table over time. Okay, next we're gonna demonstrate uh, schema evolution. Um, so let's read the table back in. We're gonna say spark.read, so with a single command, we can pull this data back in. 
And by the way, if we wanted to, uh, to load a specific version, like by default, we get the latest, but we can also say version as of. So if we add version as of option, we can get a particular version other than the latest. We do a quick count. We have all of our records. It looks good here. Um, so let's keep going. So schema evolution, basically, so Delta Lake has both schema enforcement as well as schema evolution. If we don't use the right um, uh, commands, then we're protected from overriding the schema with uh, records that don't match. Uh, so our goal will be, though, that we do want to evolve the schema. So we end up doing that. So the way we're going to do that is add two additional columns to the data set. So uh, you see here we do the width column. So we add these, we first of all create, with using these names, we create two additional columns and we initialize those columns with literals here. Uh, so we do a quick look at the data types. We see our two additional columns. And now again, these are initialized right now to sort of null values. Um, now with this command, we can, we basically tell it that we want to, we, we are approving the changes in the schema. So we're, we're enabling schema evolution we do want to overwrite what's there with the new schema. So we do that with this, this option right here. So first thing, now let's use our Delta table again. We, we query it again and we say, yep, it is in fact still true that it's a Delta table. And now um, let's look at the history and we show that we have um, you know, additional uh, rights to the table. Um, and so, and that makes sense because this was a, we rewrote the table with a new schema. Now let's uh, show you how you can use the update method um, to uh, fill the, first of all, fill the data and to prove that the, the new columns are indeed accessible. So we'll use this uh, predicate condition right here. Uh, so we're going to overwrite, um, we're going to overwrite this thing called fully funded and we'll do so, um, uh, sorry, funding type. We're going to overwrite the column here called funding type with this value called fully funded whenever the loan amount equals the funded amount. And so uh, we see here for these first five that the loan amount and the funded amount, uh, they're equivalent. And so fully funded becomes the value here, overriding the, the default null. Uh, let's get a little fancier. So now we're gonna pass a function to that same update command. So we're gonna, uh, instead of uh, passing a literal value, we're going to pass a variable value. We're going to actually execute this function when we run this command. So we're able to actually pass a function. The function is called int excess interest rate. Um, so anything over 10%, we're going to call excess interest rate. Um, and then we're going to return that uh, a value of the rate minus 10. So we run that and we quickly find out that um, uh, we, we now can fill this excess interest rate with the value. So we took 13.99 minus 10, and we got 3.99. That is the, the amount that is considered excessive. And so 14.85 uh, becomes 4.85, et cetera. Okay, now we have values for all of these, and we're able to show the table history um, right there, and we see that there's additional, uh, every time we do these updates, we query the history and we see additional uh, versions are, are available. So that's the the notebook um, that I wanted to show you. Um, and so hold on. So this this is uh, all encompassed in a blog here, which we can we can share. I'll I'll punch this into the chat. So uh, so myself and and Vedant we published this blog in March, and this walks you through this solution that we just went through, and then the um, in addition, we have the repository out here uh, for you, and, and we can provide that as well. So here's uh, out here on GitHub under AWS samples. We have this this particular notebook stored under something called uh, the repository named SageMaker Delta Lake Integration. Uh, so we can share that as well. So that summarizes the demo and the presentation, and I will uh, get off now and and start looking through the the chat. Yeah, Paul, great talk. Uh, I posted the link to the notebook, so the repo. I also just posted the blog. 
Um, and let's see, answered a couple questions, but maybe um, let me kind of summarize. Uh, well, yeah, actually, like one question I have, because I always forget this about the S3A and the S3, what was the purpose of that again? Yeah, so let me go back. Because um, yeah, I know when so, I'm, yeah, like when I copy samples, I sometimes see it and sometimes don't. And it's just like 50-50 if I, if I remember to do it. What, um, what's the downside if yeah. I don't do it? Well, so depending on the, okay, so we're operating, as I said, first of all, in Studio. Studio is a, um, uses Conda to set up its dependencies. And, you know, the first thing that we did to our Conda environment was that we installed some prerequisites that we knew that we would need. And those included uh, OpenJDK, they included the uh, PySpark and Delta Spark. But, um, you know, Delta Spark, and, and, and then what, Notice down here when we created our Spark, uh, Spark context. So one of the things that Spark needs needs access to is this Hadoop AWS library. Um, this Hadoop AWS library has been around for years, and um, what and the purpose of it was to enable the Hadoop specific extensions. Uh, when you're running on top of S3, uh, you need certain extensions in order to make the things like um, Hive commands and other pieces of Hadoop uh, to, to run successfully. And it, when, you're, when you're utilizing this Hadoop AWS library, then you need to switch over from S3 protocol to S3A in order to get the full functionality. Uh, so it may be that in the past when you have, have used standard S3, that maybe you're just doing um, you know, some operations that don't require those Hadoop libs, but if you, in general, like most of the functions that I've seen uh, will throw errors if they don't use the S3A protocol uh, when running inside of a um, Jupyter environment as created by AWS. So not to say that you, you know, it's mandated in all situations, but it's, it's definitely the safer approach um, now, if you're running pure native Spark on Databricks, you won't see S3A protocol utilized. Uh, but that's, it's really a way to switch on additional functionality um, so that you're, you're you know, it, it, has, it comes down to dependency management in the end. Uh, and unfortunately, dependency management is an ugly business. And, and there's, uh, so this is just, an outcome of the way that these libraries are loaded and uh, and become avail made available. Okay, um, one other quick question to, so does this notebook require Studio or could I actually run this in a Jupyter environment in the wild? This one is specific to Studio because of this container credentials provider, uh, but wow. let me show you, there's another, okay, there's another one and Chris, I can send it to you. We have, um, so here I am running, uh, we also have built out these other additional um, notebooks that don't use Studio. And so this one in particular, so here's one that's used, this is running in what's called the classic notebook. So this would be, you know, non-Studio. This is like pre-Studio uh, notebook instances, just the standard notebook instance. And so what we did here was we used pandas to ingest this data at the object level. Remember that was the quote easiest method mechanism. And so uh, this this notebook is running not in Studio. And so when you let me scroll down to the Spark session, this one uses the um, the manifest files. So you'll see extra code in here. Um, actually, so yeah, we're not going to. We're not going to um, access it with Spark. We're going to use Pandas to load the data in this. So, um, yeah, it's so there, basically you need a, a one line change. If you're not going to run in Studio, this this one would be a, a different credentials provider. And that's just because of, you know, Studio environment has a different credentials provider than standard classic notebooks would. Gotcha. 
Okay, so maybe you could share some of those other notebooks and then uh, there's also a question in the chat if you could handle that offline um, can we also see schema changes and then i think we're going to switch it over to matt uh, winkler from dbt labs matt are you ready to go oh thanks so much buddy yep 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 uh, i'm good should i go ahead and share my screen yeah please i'll drop off video and uh, please introduce yourself and really looking forward to this Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Paul. That was, a, that was a great presentation. Um, I always like seeing more about um, how Delta Lake's kind of being used in the wild because we, we hear about that a lot from our from our customers here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit different. Um, just a quick introduction to myself. Um, historically, I've done a lot of hands-on data science work, doing stuff in Python. Um, I've worked with Spark mostly through, uh, through PySpark and EMR, um, but have some familiarity with just kind of building out the mechanics of training, building models. Um, in particular, really enjoyed uh, doing some NLP, which we used for search optimization. Um, that was going back a couple of jobs. Uh, more recently, um, I've, really, I've really enjoyed being a solution architect, um, both of my previous role and at DBT Labs. And I, I really like thinking about how ML can fit into the broader analytics stack. Um, just kind of quick, quick poll of the crowd. I'm curious what sort of backgrounds we have on the line here. I know Chris mentioned there's a lot of kind of spark folks here, but maybe if folks could just in the chat throw, um, you know, a, a one to three with their familiarity of, of spark and um, spark itself, maybe some ML familiarity. And then how about with uh, just kind of basic SQL? Because um, we're, we're, we are going to talk about what that looks like uh, in DBT as well. Let's see, Let's see two. Spark. All right, we'll let those we'll let those come in. I'll just I'll kind of give a, a little bit of background, set the stage, um, and uh, go from there. So um, you know, over the over the last four years, we've really seen um, four years ish. We've really seen cloud based ML platforms grow uh, in popularity. Um, obviously, SageMaker is um, one of the leaders there, uh, other specialized vendors as well, um, kind of coming into the picture and just making the ML productionalization process easier. Um, AutoML, definitely a trend um, uh, towards enabling a broader range of people uh, to kind of participate in the process. Um, and then at DBT, we actually have started hearing a lot more um, about in warehouse machine learning. Um, so including tools like Redshift, which actually have supported this for, for a number of years. Um, I think we're starting to see kind of how data warehouses have more capabilities than people might have thought uh, uh, or, or how you might think about them uh, as a tool, right? So it's kind of a loaded term. Um, and, and really we see tools like Redshift um, that can support a lot more than just kind of vanilla data storage and, and querying. Um, I think for ML in particular, there's kind of a, there's kind of a sweet spot uh, for uh, more maybe uh, bread and butter sort of use cases. You might think like churn, lead scoring, progression, uh, fraud detection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think of that as a as a nice combination of things where teams that are maybe more uh, you know that don't have a, a dedicated group of data science users, uh, maybe they're a little bit resource constrained there, or more machine learning focused teams looking to scale their processes, uh, may be able to leverage um, kind of this in warehouse ML approach to things to help get up and running more quickly. Um, and I'll talk about kind of what that looks like with DBT in the picture, and then also just kind of DBT in general and where that sits um, in the stack and how to, how to use it. Um, so, uh, DBT is, it's an open source data transformation tool and it sits on top of a modern data warehouse. Uh, and really it fits into the picture with groups that are using um, an ELT approach uh, where we've kind of seen the industry go over the last couple of years versus more traditional kind of ETL, right? So with ELT, basically what's happening is raw data is being loaded and then it's accessible from your warehouse or your querying layer. Um, and then, uh, all of the transformation happens there, or much of the transformation. Um, and then you, you're publishing data sets for consumption by 
downstream tools. So whether that's for BI, whether that's for ML, um, or just kind of like ad hoc operational analytics. Um, and DBT owns the transformation step of that workflow, right? So our focus is kind of on, uh, our, our perspective, I guess, is that transformation is complex enough that it really needs to be approached as a software engineering pro problem where you have a dedicated development framework, you're testing things as you go, um, and a really inherent use of version control and managing different versions of, of code uh, throughout your deployment life cycles. So how DBT works, um, we really put the focus on primarily working in SQL um, and, and uh, focusing on expressing our business logic using those SQL statements, but with a little bit of a different flavor to it. So the way we define each unit in a DBT pipeline um, is through, through a select statement like you see here, but we've got this ref inserted in here, right? So instead of hard coding um, the table reference that you see in the bottom here, this analytics dev stage orders, we have this ref statement. And what that is, is, is really a logical pointer to this upstream uh, object in our pipeline. Um, and this does a couple of interesting things for us. Um, Number one, it enables us to really easily separate environments. So by uh, by removing my hard coded reference to this specific thing that lives in, in my dev schema here, I'm able to, to set configurations around that code and then move it between different environments without changing anything about from a logical perspective, what this query actually looks like. And then this analytics dev stage orders is all resolved for me based on the configurations I have um, in my project. And I'll, I'll show what this looks like live um, when we get to the kind of the live demo portion. Um, so separating environments, uh, one big thing. And then another piece is um, dependency ordering. So because DBT knows that this stage orders object lives upstream of orders, then it knows what to process in what order, right? So state in an actual pipeline run, stage orders is going to come first, and then orders will come downstream from that. And what this starts to look like at a little bit more scale, um, you see our, our raw source data kind of on the left here, and then through uh, code that's been built up like the ref statements we showed in the previous slide, you see these arrows being drawn between this, these raw data sets, kind of our intermediate processing nodes, and then at the end of the chain here, kind of an exposure node, maybe this is something that's powering a a dashboard or an ML model. Um, so data testing, a key feature of, of DBT, and there's a couple of different flavors of, uh, of testing that you can use with DBT. Um, so number one would be uh, what we call out of the box tests or, or generic tests, like you see in this schema.yaml file up at the top here. Uh, sorry, this is, I think this may be a little small for folks. Um, but basically what we're doing here in the first case is say primary primary key validation. So this order ID column has both a unique and a not null test applied to it um, by which we know the grain that we're operating at, right? Um, the status column has a set of acceptable values. And if we see something outside of that, then we can configure warnings or errors to, to trigger based on that. Um, there's also a custom testing framework where you can do things like this example here, where we're validating that there isn't any, um, there's no records with a negative amount column in my fact payments table. Um, so with this, basically anything that we can write into a SQL statement, we can test in DBT because it's just going to perform an assertion where if this query ends up returning rows, then it fails. And if it, if it returns nothing, then, then we pass the test. Um, and really by, by kind of putting these tests right alongside our pipeline development, um, it makes that overall process easier because a developer um, just has to really think about things like what are my business constraints, what grain am I operating at, what's acceptable here, and we have an easy mechanism or interface for being able to specify those, um, which then can be run all the way through our deployment cycles from our, our dev environments through staging, through production, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and having that framework in place um, just gives you a lot more confidence working through uh, working through deployments. Um, you don't have to go and build a whole separate testing framework. Um, like I remember in, in past lives, kind of do, building those ML pipelines, testing was just a, co a constant problem. Um, and I tried kind of building some things um, like in PyTest, kind of more of a, a unit testing uh, approach, I would say, which maybe covered like 30% of the use cases, I would say, that were out there. Um, so it definitely wasn't valueless, but um, 
it, what I was missing really was the ability to specify conditions about the, the data itself, uh, which DBT does a, does a really good job of and a lot of our, a lot of our customers and users in the community um, get a lot of value out of the, the testing framework. Um, so there's like, and there's a couple of ways that we can deploy DBT. Um, so DBT core is a free open source version, um, which you can get, yeah, uh, it's on PyPy. Uh, so you can pip install it, um, run that on a, uh, locally or on a server anywhere. Um, from a management perspective, uh, your users will need to be uh, familiar with managing Python environments, working from the command line. Um, really, really good for smaller teams looking to experiment with DBT or just kind of kind of getting started. Um, DBT Cloud is a fully managed um, service. Uh, includes a, a jobs framework. There's alerts built in. Uh, and there's a browser browser based IDE, and with that, we're basically handling the the infrastructure and all those dependencies for you. So um, groups get uh, up and running more quickly. Uh, you can also sign up and, and test that out for free uh, with the developer account. Um, so hopefully that was a good introduction to DBT. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to just show uh, what working with both core and cloud looks like, just so you get a feel for the experience. Um, and then, yeah, definitely interested to, to take any questions once we, once we get through that. Um, let me... I'm going to start showing core. Uh, so basically, in my VS Code here, uh, I've got my DBT ML, ML workflow, AWS virtual environment here. So I've, I've cloned, this is, this is a Git repo that I've cloned locally here. Um, and I've got my models uh, defined as part of this project. So you can see uh, from a pipeline perspective, what, what I've got here is some initial data staging, moving through a pre-processing layer, prepared data set. And then uh, in my ML models kind of section here, I've got training and inference, right? Um, so fairly simple. Um, in my case, I've just got a handful of things that are built out here. And I'm dealing with some data that's been loaded to S3. Um, and my use case here is um, identifying fraud. So I just, I took this from one of the uh, example data sets that, uh, that SageMaker provides, uh, loaded those to S3, and then I can access them via Redshift uh, and manage that whole process with DBT. So what I'm doing here is staging some of that raw data that's in an external schema. Um, so you can see I've got a pointer to where my claims data lives. I've just got it sitting in CSV. To, um, and I've actually applied some testing here, say on the policy ID column, that's part of this claims data. And I can, I can assert uh, that that's, that thing has to be both unique and not null. So I make sure there's not uh, kind of problems with grain working here. Um, external customers, uh, similar. Um, so, uh, you know, once I have these source mappings in place, this is kind of how I connect to those raw data sets that we looked at uh, on that, that graph a little bit earlier of where DBT sits in the stack. Um, as far as how I uh, installed this, um, I would have just run this command. To Redshift. Um, I'm not going to run this live for everyone, but this is how I uh, got set up here. And you can see the, the output of my DBT version has Redshift and um, the Redshift plugin that I'm running on the, the latest version of, of the DBT core library. So the way, the way we think about interacting with particular warehouses is we have adapters, so I should do this on the screen, <clears throat> like DBT Redshift that control how we compile things like the, the SQL that's written in this stage claims model uh, from DBT, our adapters determine how that's actually compiled and then how those commands are issued down to the warehouse to run. Um, Chris, I remember you highlighted some use of Spark here. Um, we do also have a, a DBT Spark adapter, um, and this is also supported in the, in the cloud project, just to kind of mention that real quick. Um, cool. So as far as running things, um, that should give you a, a decent idea of what's uh, of how to kind of get started uh, with DBT core. It's basically just install the library, clone a DBT repo, um, and then you know kind of that's that's basically it. <laughs> it's it's pretty easy actually. Um, cool. So let's let's flip gears a little bit. And now I've I've brought up 
kind of the, the parallel concept in uh, the DBT Cloud managed service. Um, I kind of like to use this for demo purposes because there's some nice visual elements here. Um, and this is where I would be going to write my code as part of working on my pipeline from a DBT Cloud perspective. Um, I can get a similar view of documentation from core. It just takes a little bit more work to kind of host it and share all of that stuff. Um, but what I've got here is showing how this, this fraud detection pipeline looks uh, overall, right? And what's interesting about this is that this fraud detection model actually represents something that's being trained uh, and deployed all by the integration between Redshift and AWS SageMaker. Right. So I've got kind of some, some basic processing going on on these claims and customers uh, tables that I highlighted from the core side a little bit earlier. Uh, just for example, if I look at my stage claims model, you can see I'm just doing a little bit of data cleanup because my downstream steps, did, they basically didn't like the slash in this NA here, so I was just getting rid of those. Um, then I can do some pre-processing here. Um, so... Uh, be able to uh, you know, select from that raw data. Uh, in this case, this, this case statement is basically doing some, some ordinal encoding. Um, and then one other interesting thing about DBT is some of the, the libraries that you can install to kind of get up and running more quickly. So in this case, I'm using one called DBT ML preprocessing, which includes a one hot encoder, right? So I'm pointing that to my upstream table I'm saying I want to do one hot encoding on this driver relationship column. Uh, and then I have a specification for how to handle values that might be null, right? And the, the output of this will be a set of columns, you know, with each, each individual value um, kind of pivoted out uh, and then ones and zeros for, you know, where the, where the values were in the original data. Um, cool. So at the end of the day, this, this all becomes this data set that I'm using to drive my training here. I'm just going to illustrate real quickly what happens uh, if I preview this against the data that's actually in Redshift. So um, kind of like other C uh, SQL editors you might have seen here, I can, I can just bring results back to the screen and look at my data, right? Kind of always a good practice. Um, to help build the intuition on the ref statements here, I always like to bring up this compiled SQL view and show a little side by side here where you can see that how pre-processed claims was interpreted um, at runtime here to run against uh, my dev database, this dbtml workflow schema, and then uh, the upstream object, right? So the, the again, the ref is kind of dynamically interpreted when I went to, to preview that to point to the correct upstream thing. Cool. Um, so let's take a look at what running these things looks like. So DBT has a, has a robust, we call it selection syntax, which I can use to kind of guide how things go in my processing pipeline. So say, for example, I just wanted to refresh this data set. I could use this DBT run command like so, and then include the plus syntax, which means I'm going to refresh anything that's a parent of this final data set, right? Hey, Matt. Yeah, please. I think uh, we're still seeing the code. Oh, I'm so, oh my gosh. Yeah, I was trying to follow. I thought I was following, and then someone else pointed out that it's not <laughs> matching. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, this is uh, DBT Cloud. Okay, great. Which I yeah. So flip gears, um, this was the lineage view that I meant to bring up. Um, and what this is illustrating basically is this fraud detection model. Uh, just to recap that real quick. This is actually being the training and deployment of this model for batch inference is actually being run by uh, the Redshift and SageMaker integration. I'll show what that looks like in a second. What I was showing before, uh, yeah, thank you so much for pointing that out, Chris. Uh, is that this data set, I can refresh using this syntax right here with this dbt run. And what this is going to do is run all the, the uh, dependencies of this final data set node uh, and do it all in order, right? So you can see my stage claims, stage customers, pre-processed data sets, and then the final one uh, all got run by this. Uh, if we look, 
unpack these in a little bit more detail, you can actually see the, the SQL that DBT is running here. Um, so decent amount going on here. Uh, but yeah, all of this is kind of logged for you. Cool. Uh, so once I've done that, maybe it's time to uh, retrain my model here. I could do that separately and say fraud detection model. And now on top of that data set node, um, this will spur a retraining job in SageMaker, which I need to quickly plug back into. Okay, so when I ran that last command from the DVT side, you can see that we're, we're refreshing the existing model. So we dropped one and now we're creating another one, this DVT ML workflow dev and fraud detection model. And you can see SageMaker is doing its thing now. So it's just gonna train a new uh, XGBoost model to uh, with the, the fraud column in my data set as the target. Um, train a new model for me. And then all the deployment and management of that process is actually happening kind of under the hood between Redshift and SageMaker, which I think is really cool because it enables somebody who's maybe more focused on just like what the overall process looks like, how this fraud detection model relates to both these upstream sources. And, you know, imagine as this grows, there's probably a lot of other use cases you could manage as part of this. So this graph is going to broaden but you still get context into how this model is trained and where it lives kind of within your overall uh, framework and, and lineage here. Um, as far as the mechanics of how that training actually goes, um, what I did was I set up in DBT, we, we call them materializations. So that's basically an object in the database, right? So this data set in particular is materialized as a table, right? And you can see from my run earlier, when I did that, uh, it ended up creating a table in the warehouse. So there's just a, you know, that, that data set with my, my fraud column and all the other, um, uh, all of my uh, other training variables uh, is loaded in a, in a data set in Redshift. Um, and, but this fraud detection model is a little different. It's materialized as a machine learning model. So I set up um, some code that will map these variables that I need to pass into the command between Redshift and SageMaker uh, at runtime to kind of spur my retraining there. Um, so you can see what that looks like is just this create model statement here. Uh, and then you can see I've just mapped some other variables to kind of determine uh, what gets passed into that. So the SQL statement, which gives me the actual data is mapped from here. Star just means select all my columns and I'm, I'm leaving off the policy ID. Um, so it's not really going to be generalizable. Um, then other things like uh, the name of the function, the target variable, uh, access roles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also an interesting option. You can, you can specify auto ML here too. So if you kind of want to go with the, the easy button approach, um, you can do that. I did that uh, kind of during testing, um, so you can see one of the ones I, I launched uh, and then did a considerable amount of uh, <laughs> trained to over 100 models. Uh, I ended up stopping it just for testing, but you, you have that, that option as well. Um, cool. So after I've done all of that, let's actually let's see how we're doing here. Okay, cool. So that training job that I launched uh, looks like that uh, looks like that is done. Um, let's see real quick if the model's ready. Okay, so okay, so really what, what's going on here is Neo is now compiling that. Uh, it's kind of going through the deployment process. Um, I have a backup one uh, here. So just this, this is really just to show that DBT can kind of support ad hoc querying as well. 
Uh, so you can see in my case how the, the the actual values of my target variable relate to what I predicted, kind of a little confusion matrix here. Um, you can see in this case, there's it's actually pretty rare to have fraud. Um, our recall is decent on this model, uh, but uh, you know I, did, I didn't do a ton of uh, of parameter tuning. Uh, uh, to be honest, on this, I was just kind of more focused on what the overall process here looks like. Um, the the last thing I really wanted to show is just kind of what productionalization looks like uh, from a uh, really from a cloud or core standpoint. Um, it's probably easier to show in cloud, um, but we can talk about what it looks like in core as well. So basically, those commands that I was running a little bit earlier, like that that, that dbt run, selecting the data set, selecting the model, um, those would just get placed into things like this pre-processing job here. So you can see I gave it a couple of test runs um, kind of this morning. Um, and if we look at the, the job definition, this is basically just determining what's going to get deployed uh, whenever we want to run things. Um, so you can see in this case, I've got that same command that I ran from the, uh, the UI a little bit earlier, this dbt run, select, and then refresh my, my end data set. So this is going to run that data set node and all of its dependencies. Um, I had the schedule set to off, but I could turn this on and refresh it on some interval. Um, I could also interact with our API uh, and, and trigger it on demand from, a, from an external process like, uh, like Airflow, maybe a, a step function workflow if you're going more uh, AWS native, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then I have other jobs set up to actually trigger the model training and then any downstream inference once those models are trained and, and available in, um, in Redshift. So overall, um, pretty compact uh, architecture. Um, here, basically, it's it's DBT and then abstracting away all of the the model management to the SageMaker side. Um, and I, I'm really interested in feedback from the group here on just kind of the that simplified architecture versus something like um, you know managing. All of those separate processes from uh, from the SageMaker side, and really the the handoffs there between a group that's maybe more focused on um, data pipelines, more of like traditional use cases, I would say, um, but definitely interested uh, in incorporating ML into their workflows. Um, and I think there's also something to be said for just the the time savings from being able to handle some more of the uh, kind of bread and butter use cases. Uh, with a simpler overall architecture. That's pretty much what I have. Um, we can go ahead and, and turn that over to, to questions now. I see the polls coming in. <laughs> yeah, I threw up a, a poll that, um, you know, probably should have been thrown up at the beginning of your talk, but just to get an idea of where people are at. You know, so, so there's tons of questions, by the way. Um, I know we're, we're over, Matt, do you have like an extra couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, I booked some overflow time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so we'll keep recording here. Uh, and it looks like, you know, almost even across the three yeah. areas, yeah. maybe a little bit skewed more towards the SQL. Um, and someone actually asked a really good question, which, is, or statement really, which is, you know, uh, seeing, or why are developers averse to SQL? And, yeah. and I guess it, to spin that, that statement into a question, are you seeing more and more developers saying, screw it, man, SQL's good enough. You know, I can write my code, my, my framework code some other time, but I just got to get the job done kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's always going to be some things that don't, quite fit into that sort of tabular construct that you're really thinking in when you're programming in SQL, right? Um, so, I mean, like some things, I <laughs> uh, like doing more exotic types of encodings or, um, you know, thing, things along those lines from an ML perspective, I think might be a little bit tough, but like the basic things like I showed around one hots even, um, and it really, like 90, 95% of the things that you see, uh, I think that's, I think I was reading the same comment as you, Chris, 
Um, yeah, you see more complex tooling that at the end of the day is doing the same types of operations on the data. So for me, like for me personally, like that's that's kind of the kind of the bet I ended up making, um, or it's just like you, simpler is better <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so I think like while it doesn't fit a hundred percent, I definitely think a lot of the momentum we see at DBT is driven by that that simpler approach towards how you um, how you write transformations. And then just focusing really on getting the fundamentals down around being able to test those uh, version control them, you know, uh, kind of implementing those those best practices around your around your pipelines. So a long way, a long way of saying, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I remember that when I was at Databricks a bunch of years ago, it seems now, uh, you know, Back in the very early days of Spark, when I was there, everyone was using Scala, which just blew my yep. mind because it's hard. Uh, yeah, it's hard. It, you know, <laughs> you get used to it, but yeah, to me, you know, yeah, even Java, I don't yeah. know, I just switched over to Python. And then I started seeing more and more people using SQL. Yep. And they can write the same code in like one line that, you know, yep. took me five or yep. six lines or whatever. And not have to not have to deal with like managing environment separate separately getting stuck in dependency fun land yeah. and you know, all of that kind of like just the the mechanics of getting things up and running it seems like there, there's always something that can go wrong <laughs> yeah um okay and there's a question about scaling I'm, I'm i'm kind of tackling these questions out of order a bit so um and also i'm running a poll which which language or you know system do you prefer to use yeah, Being yeah. Python and SQL coming in, yep. um, PySpark, Java, you know, Scala Spark, uh, not so much. So, so it looks like, yeah, it's really even between SQL, Python. Um, but an interesting scaling question came up where would you like recommend just letting the actual data store like Redshift handle the partitioning or would you actually try to do that partitioning at the same um, the SQL yeah, model. yeah, depend, depends on the warehouse, right? Um, so like, I don't know, some like other tools like Snowflake take more of a, uh, like an automated approach, that type of thing. Um, you can absolutely specify the partitioning or uh, key distributions on your table models through DBT. So there's just, a, there's just an additional config. Um, let's see. Uh, where's my, sorry, I've got the, these chat windows are kind of in my way. Let's see. Uh, so we would just say in here, we could say partition by so on and so forth, um, and set configs that'll, I mean, I'd have to, uh, look at exactly what the, the syntax is here, but this experience wise, this is what it would look like. You, you have control over those types of, those types of dials too, if you need it. Yeah, so I think the intuition is, um, you know, let the underlying data store. There's, yeah, there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of PhDs, a lot of folks that are optimizing yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah. In ge in general, it's like do you don't really pull that out unless you need it. You know, if you really observe performance issues, um, then that's kind of the time to start doing a little bit more specific tuning. Um, I found the plugins. Uh, folder in GitHub, in your GitHub repo. There's only, I think, three or four in there. There's Snowflake, Redshift. Um, I thought you had mentioned a couple more. And maybe yeah, um, so there's additional adapters uh, that are um, that are out there. Uh, so there's actually a really wide variety of things. So DBT Spark um, is one that, uh, that we manage. Uh, but there's other ones out there, like this one's for uh, SQL Server, Oracle. There's an Athena one that I've seen. Um, so really, the there's actually a, let's see, DBT supported adapters. If you're interested in looking at additional things, we've got documentation on this. So you can see all the ones that DBT Lab supports. There's vendor supported and then community as well. So that's kind of how we bucket them, but there's oh, a lot. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, let, me just, let me just fling this into the, the chat real quick. 
And uh, what's the difference between a plugin and uh, the adapter? Is it the same thing or just um, kind of the same thing? There is one other. So that's like for interacting with databases, I would call them all the, the same thing. Um, there is also in DBT, there are packages as well. So these are a little bit different. Um, this is like pre canned uh, functions that you can use to programmatically generate SQL. So when I showed this example earlier, this machine learning model that has kind of my, my logic for how I'm going to go and create this model, right? This just lives within my local project. But I could also take my DBT ML AWS demo and install that in a package somewhere else. Right. So that's what I've done here, for example, with this one that um, I'm not a labs produces that DBT ML pre processing package. So this is actually where I got the functionality to just do the kind of the easy one hot encoder. Somebody else developed all the logic that that takes in the arguments to this and then programmatically generates all the case statements and stuff to, to map this authorities contacted column to, to my one hots. Oh, nice. So when you joined DBT Labs, what, like a year and a half ago, did you say? Yep. Where yep. was the community then? And yeah, how has it changed in the last year and a half? Um, <laughs> I would say like the energy is the same or maybe like accelerated, but like the, the kind of, uh, thinking about things from like, we evangelize this like analytics engineering concept, right. Where it's, it's really software development applied to analytics and transformation in particular. Right. I think it's just, a, it's a group of people who are very like, it's, it's a, probably slanted more towards uh, hands-on folks who are really like, like that person who's actually doing the transformation. They're writing the, the SQL statements or Python or whatever, like a data engineer is kind of like, that's, I would say like our, our core audience, but you get a bunch of other folks in there too, up to like, I don't know, different, um, you know, business people thinking about more of like the long-term direction of where, where analytics is going, um, how DBT can integrate with other, other tools in the stack from a, from a visualization, metadata perspective, um, so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a, it's a good time in there. <laughs> yeah, are visualization supported in DBT Cloud? Uh, we have some integrations with tools like um, uh, Mode in Analytics, in particular. Um, one other interesting thing that we're we're working on is being able to kind of create uh, a contract between something like what uh, my actual model here. So if we look at this pipeline, right? In this case, I'm doing it for, for ML here, but say this data set also has um, kind of dashboards that are consuming on top of it, right? And maybe they're running various different levels of aggregations on top of this. Um, being able to create a contract between what that looks like in kind of an intermediate area that is also version controlled um, but gives a little bit more specificity to how those downstream tools interact with the, the data in the warehouse to kind of make it more towards um, being able to just specify in a like more declarative or mark upable fashion what what they want from a metrics perspective without having to kind of negotiate managing. Because a lot of times what you see is like that last mile of analytics, there's extra SQL that gets put in there. Right. And it's stuff that it's harder to version control. It's harder to reconcile with what's happening in your pipeline. So we're, we're working on creating some, um, that, that sort of contracting concept there as an integration point. Okay. Um, bunch more questions, even since I said there were a bunch more questions, <laughs> um, let me just get to a couple of them here. So the scaling up one we got, uh, someone's asking, you know, for the deck and maybe a couple bullet points to pass on to their customer uh, to summarize advantage of DBT over traditional SQL. You know, do you have like a 30 second kind of elevator pitch? Yeah, yeah, I would say advantage over traditional SQL is how, how you operationalize it, right? So with DBT, I get this nice view of what my lineage looks like just by adopting this convention of using the ref statement here. Like that's all I change in terms of how I think about uh, running SQL. 
uh, for DBT versus not, right? Otherwise, I have to kind of manage all of that dependency resolution. I don't have an easy mechanism for separating my dev and prod workloads, right? Because again, I can run this same code and just config set up a, um, I'll not just show it instead of tell it, <laughs> um, set up a separate environment for deployment. That's actually where those jobs I was running a little bit earlier look like. Um, but all I would need to do to run that in a different schema, like if I wanted to make this production, I could change this to production and I'm done, right? Um, so I have a really easy mechanism for being able to kind of target things to different locations within my warehouse and just make that overall process easier to manage. Um, and then maybe some of the testing, you know, the like, test first approach, uh, pipeline yep. first approach, which is what you're hinting at here, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you actually, that, I was kind of thinking the exact same thing. Um, so I'll show just what testing looks like real quick. So you can see that the, the configs I have in the CML file, this data prep is just targeted towards my data set. I want to make sure I know what grain I'm working at, right? But I could get way more complex with this. Um, uh, and I, the, the cool thing is I can test anywhere from kind of this consumption ready data. I've also got tests configured on my raw data, right? So I can validate that integration point between my uploader and my transformation pipeline. Um, there's actually another interesting, uh, it's not a, not a schema test, but uh, it's called a source freshness test that we could do. So um, we could add something else here where there's a condition and I'd say my column looks like like whatever my load date is here. And then I'd say um, that the timing has to look like, uh, let's see, six and then date part hours. And then this will this will confirm that there's uh, records that have been loaded within the last six hours here on my external claims call. So that way I can um, validate that the uh, my data loader is kind of performing up to par. Right. Can I test? Yeah, speaking of tests, like can I profile my data? So. Nope. You can. Um, so there's actually a couple of interesting uh, packages that are out there. Um, so audit helper package. So we, we talked about this a little bit ago, um, but the way you would install that would be through this packages.yaml. And then I can install my dependencies by just running this command called dbt depths. And so go look through this YAML grab all of the code that's kind of pre-canned from these various providers and install them into my, my local dev environment. Um, but as far as um, auditing goes, um, this is one example uh, where you can compare uh, tables, compare queries that generate them, column values. So look at the overlap, right? And understand uh, whether you're kind of meeting what maybe if really useful for like a migration use case. Right, or you can understand if you're up to par with what a, a, a pipeline external of DBT is generating. Um, there's also DBT expectations. Uh, I can't spell, but this will. Where we've got uh, much of the functionality that's uh, present in great expectations uh, that's been coded into DBT macros. Um, so you can look at things here like distributional assumptions. Um, remember this one from, I was looking at it last week. Um, you can do that over time. So the, really anything that you can write into, uh, into SQL um, is, uh, is, is runnable in DBT. Awesome. Um, just a couple more here. I see the last one about the integrated scheduler um, versus core. Uh, yeah, that is that is fair to assume. We're managing all of the compute and that deployment uh, for you with cloud. With core, like 
you could install it on, on EC2. A lot of times we see people running their own Kubernetes clusters and kind of dockerizing everything. Um, just more to manage from an infrastructure standpoint, for sure. Um, the other thing to consider there is just how sophisticated uh, your run syntax gets. So like the more you're doing things like this select statement to really target things specifically, you kind of have to have a process in place to manage all the logging that comes out of that, um, alerting those types of those types of issues as well. And does DPT support step caching? So if, yeah, okay. Yeah, good question. So like if, uh, I think you're thinking about that, uh, like logically determining whether something's changed right. before you run it. Um, DBT is kind of a, it's a, it thinks about things a little bit differently than that um, by default. So what's going to happen every time I run something like a table here, is it's going to issue a create a replace statement on that table. So it's going to do, a, it's going to do a full refresh of that every time. Um, there are other materializations that come out of the box. So there's an incremental concept. So you can do upsert on, instead of doing that full reload, right? You just do, um, you're either doing merge or you're doing like a delete plus insert kind of, uh, kind of concept there. Um, there's also a snapshot, which is used to uh, version data over time. So some of the, the concepts that Paul was talking about with, uh, with Delta Lake uh, definitely apply with snapshots where we're going to look at change tracking on the incoming data versus your target data set and then add, um, it, it's like a type two, basically. Um, all of that said, as far as run caching goes, um, really the, the way we would approach that is via the, the selection syntax. So if none of your upstream source data has actually changed, then we can use this in such a way that we're only running the subset of the pipeline um, that's related to those upstream sources, which, is, which have uh, been updated. So my selection syntax in that case would look a little bit different where I could say source status and say fresh plus. So what that'll do is over time running those source freshness jobs, I was talking about testing that a, a few minutes ago, we can mark and say, okay, I've got new records in this particular source. So I'm just gonna select the sources that are actually freshly updated as well as anything that's downstream of that, right? Um, and that's actually a, that's actually something that we we recently integrated into into DBT core, um, and then be, when it's part of core, it becomes part of cloud as well. So you get the same sort of selection syntax and capabilities there. Um, but we just we kind of approach that a little bit differently. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense for your question there, Chris. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Can we schedule these refreshes? Is there? For sure. Yep. Yep. So. Um, with the job that we looked at a little bit earlier. Uh, we can just go back to our pre-processing here. I was just clicking this run now button just to make sure it was working. But uh, in the settings here, um, I could run this kind of on an easy button, do like specific days of the week, every every so many hours. I could do custom cron, right? So you could actually, you can yeah run things that way. Um, I, like, I, I like running things on a cron schedule just because it's nice and simple. Right. Um, if you have more kind of event driven uh, or sophisticated needs, uh, cloud also has an API that you can use. So it's just a post request to run this. So we see we see people do that with uh, with Airflow all the time. Man, yeah, I don't know who yeah, who wouldn't use this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an easy way to run transformations. That's for sure. Yeah. So. Um, uh, someone's asking about a blog. Uh, I assume you guys do have a blog. Is is this yep. particular example maybe with with SageMaker? Have you? We we haven't put it up there. Um, I'll have to just because you know it's kind of happened all over the last the last month. There's a whole uh, yeah. content management group that tries to get people like myself to to write articles and stuff. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely interested in doing that just because I I do really like kind of uh, thinking about like what a what a good simple sort of uh ml ops architecture looks like um and uh i, def I definitely think there's there's something to be said for uh, uh putting the focus on um 
kind of where, where the data lives uh, in, a, in a warehouse without having to worry about moving it everywhere and having you know dedicated processes for all these, these types of things for um, training, retraining, pre-processing, all that stuff. Um, really here, as long as you can, as long as you can interact between, uh, between Redshift and, and SageMaker to actually do the core ML functions, um, you have a lot of that operational, the, the, that side of things in place. Uh, and the SageMaker, so that integration came through as a plugin. No, that's all. That's just native Redshift functionality. I didn't have to. I didn't have to do anything special from a DBT perspective to do right. that. Other than I had to. I created this code, right? Um, and then just gave it the SQL command that tells Redshift to say, "Hey, so it's telling Redshift, hey, go tell SageMaker to train this thing." Right, it's just this create model statement, but this is all supported by by Redshift itself. So, like, that's actually a really good point. Like, for for DBT, I mean, the way the way we think about that is like, the better and more powerful the underlying warehouse, like the the better the experience you're going to get working with DBT. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay. So scheduling, we got um, question about is DBT planning to branch into graph databases. As well. um that's a good question um i actually don't have the latest there i'd have to follow up with the the product folks to see okay. we do um we do periodically have uh staging days where you can get kind of the the latest and greatest from the the product team um so we can see if we can pass over uh a link to the next one to our aws folks and then share it out from there yeah uh and then doing eda so the exploratory data animal which would be, you know, more on the visualization side. For sure, for sure. Um, so it, like our, our interface here um, definitely supports doing kind of descriptive analysis of things. So similar to, um, this is like looking at the end of the chain here where I've just got SQL that's kind of spitting out my, my confusion matrix, right? But I could absolutely profile my data and understand what that looks like using, using SQL statements. Um, DBT isn't going to uh, like our focus is more on the the in warehouse transformation versus being a an analytics or BI layer per se, right? Um, so at at this time, like popping up a a graph or something in this interface to show you know like if I wanted to look like I know from looking at this data set that uh, so the next staging day is tomorrow. Thanks, Julian. <laughs> awesome. Um, I know that fraud's only 3% of my records here, right? Just from looking at the data, but I, I don't have like a, a bar graph that shows that in here, so. Yeah. Awesome, so sign up for that staging day. Um, I, I can tell some folks are getting nervous about SQL only and someone's asking about like an escape patch if I wanna just run Python code. Yep. Or, yeah, Python adapter. Or... Yep. Uh, fair question. Um, I would say just watch for more product updates from us on that. It's not, it's not something that's, that's live today. Um, but yeah, definitely something that's, uh, that's on our minds because there, there are right. Like there's it, SQL doesn't cover everything. Like I don't, I don't mean to make that bold of a claim. I would say it covers a lot of things. Um, and it's worth thinking about, uh, the efficiency of how you use your tooling related to that. All right, we're at the bottom of the hour. So uh, Matt, thanks so much. Um, Paul, if you're still on, thanks so much. Uh, let's keep in touch, bud. Yeah, this, this was great. I really appreciate the time here. Um, got really good engagement from folks, really great questions. Yeah. So thank you everyone for, for participating. Awesome. Yeah, have a good week. See ya. Bye.